Hello, and welcome to Rome 2. Episode 3, It Feels Like the First Turn. So, we're just going to end this turn right away, and then while the turn is going through the AI's move, I'll give you guys a brief update. So, first off, apologies are in order. I had to go to work Friday, which I wasn't anticipating, and it was miserable outside, and then I did not feel well. I woke up over the weekend with a sinus infection, and I was just kind of like, well, this sucks, so I didn't do anything. So it's Monday, doing Friday's episodes. Thankfully, I don't have that many people, I think, even following me, so I don't think anyone's too heartbroken about it, but there you go. Turns out when you're trying to produce three episodes a week, when something like that happens, it could be a little crazy. So yeah, apologies. As the name of the title suggested, we are finally ending our first turn. The time has come for bones to be broken. So speak our gods, and so must it be. Turns out, as well as ending our first turn, the Ligurians of Genoa have ended their non-aggression pact with me. They did that on their turn, so... Okay, we have no choice but to accept it. We will finally be rid of winter. See what spring has in store for us here. And there we go. The turn is complete. Welcome to turn two. Spring of 278 BCE. We're going to go through our event messages first. We have the household expands. Marcus Caecilius Scarus, the governor, has got a pet snake. Hiss! Plus one cunning, plus 8% chance of wounding enemy agents in self-defense. Unseasonal conditions in early spring in Latium. Alright, for those of you out there that live in areas where winter is problem right like upstate new york winter is very very problematic here we get snow we get sleet we get freezing rain we get four feet of snow so if spring comes early do you think that's a good thing hell yeah it's a good thing early spring thank fortuna the snows melt and the birds sing plus six public order per turn plus two growth per turn plus 6% morale for all units in the local armies, and plus 5% wealth from agriculture. And this is what I love about DEI. It has dynamic weather. Just one of the small things that just, it speaks to me. So I do, I do landscaping and lawn care, which means my job rotates around the weather. For instance, this past year, we actually had an early spring. I was actually out doing work sometime in early to mid-March, which usually... There's still snow on the ground. Sometimes there's snow on the ground into May. With that said, we did have a frost in the last week of May that absolutely murdered a whole bunch of buds that were coming off like rose bushes and other stuff. So, you know, inclement weather is always possible. But who doesn't love an early spring? So, the entire region of Latium gets that bonus. Or the entire province of Latium. I still haven't decided whether I want to call it a region or a province. You know what? I'm going to call it a province. The province of Latium. So that includes... Roma, Esculum, Ariminum, and Aretium. I think I'm going to label regions from now on being the individual ones. So you have the Roma region, the Asculum region, the Ariminum region, and the Aretium region. That entire province has that bonus. And our quartermaster report. Legio 2 has recruited four Principes and one Equites, and Legio 1 has recruited two Principes. And that is our event messages for the term. I do want to review these tabs out here. So above the mini-map, you have event messages, which I just read. You have forces. You'll see Ulpius Severa, Decimus Claudius Nepos, Marcus Caecilius Scorus, then Legio 4, 3, 1, and 2, all hanging out on the sidebar. It shows their movement and their forces. You have provinces. So you have Latium and Magna Graecia. Those are the ones I control. And you can see all the other provinces that we currently have eyes on. Africa, Corsica at Sardinia, Sicilia, Hispania, Mauritania, Numidia, Baetica, Illyricum, Macedonia, Narbonesis, and Cisalpania. And then lastly, we have factions. These are all our known factions. They have the names. They have if we're trading with them. And then if we can trade, you know, what the value is. And then our relations. So, those are those four tabs to the side. Next, we're going to handle our governors. So... We have Decimus Claudius Nepos here. 
His bonus is culture. This dignitary is a proponent of their culture, plus six cultural influence. We are going to move him into Magna Gratia, because that's where we want our culture to really start to dominate. Right now, we are at 2.8% Latin, with a 2.8% move next turn. Let's see what moving him into Magna Gratia will do for us. just deploy him. So, I didn't talk about deployment yet. I'm going to talk about it now. For governors, they do what's called administration. Advises local officials, thereby increasing tax rates while helping protect local settlements against authoritarian, authoritarian agent actions that is cunning-based. Left click to deploy. Whilst deployed, agents cannot act against other agents. So, by deploying him here, He's going to increase the tax rate, he's going to protect local settlements against authoritarian actions, and, most importantly, he's going to gain experience. Each turn he will gain a little bit of experience until he levels up. I'm not going to go and discuss his traits or skills just yet, we'll do that when he levels up, but just for know for now that he will go to level 2 in a little while. As for the province of Magna Gratia, we are now at 3.2% move for Latin next turn. So we gained a 0.4% move in Latin by moving him down here because he is now exuding our cultural influence. Next, we're going to move Marcus Caecilius Scorus just to the other side of Rome, put him near a road just in case I want to move him elsewhere, and we are going to have him administer in the province of Latium. So that handles our governors. We're going to move over to our spy, Miss Ulpia Sevra. So Normally, I would deploy her, her near Taurus, so she can keep an eye on it, but I really want to make money. So I'm going to have her head up towards Patavium, and she's going to explore and try to make contact with new factions. So she's going to ride on past Rome, wave at Arimidum when she rides on by, then end right on the border. So she's going to head into the inner interior of Illyricum here, and then maybe northern Macedon, and sweep down into the Greek city-states area. Uh, Athens and Sparta will definitely be down here. Probably Macedonia and who knows what other city-states we might run into. So that handles our spy. We'll handle our diplomacy now, see if anything changed. So nothing there. Liguria, they are still trading with me, but we no longer have a non-aggression pact. They are still at war with the Insubres. Nothing's changed there or there. They Deorsi have declared war on the Iapodes, so that is new. The Iapodes are an interior Illyrian faction, so we'll discover them in a few turns. And that's it. I don't think anything else changed. I didn't go over the rest of them. Dalmatii, nope. Ardii, nope. Epiros, Syracuse, and Carthage, all the same. All right, so that's it for Diplomacy Roundup. Next, we're going to check out that culture update. So you saw Magna Gratia. In Latium, we are at 55.5% Latin and going up 0.5% next turn. So there's our culture update. As for public order, Latium is at a minus 3, trending to plus 4. So next turn, it'll actually have a positive of 1 public order rating. Magna Gratia is currently at minus 10, trending towards minus 4, which will put us at minus 14 next turn. But remember, the taxes are also off in Magna Gratia. We only have 8,448 denarius in the treasury. We have 1,765 denarii next turn to gain, and 8 food. By taxing the province, we would go from 1,765 to 2,241 denarii per turn, and we would go from 8 food to 14 food. The food isn't huge, and I guess the 400-ish denarii isn't huge, but I would like to turn those taxes back on. I am not doing it, though, because we go from minus 4 to minus 11 next turn, and I, I do not want to have, I want to keep things as close to positive as possible, and I'll reveal why in the future. For now, just, you don't want a super negative public order. All right, lastly, before we move on to our spotlight, construction. So, we destroyed two buildings in Latium, and now we have two empty spots. So to give you an idea here, both Ariminum and Ascalum. They are on the east coast here. They both have a Roman hamlet as their settlement. They both have ports 
they both have a construction site and they both have undeveloped land. So what is a construction site? It's where you can construct a new building. If you leave the site undeveloped for too long, slums will appear. So what I like to do is in these four building settlements, I like to have the basically the town center is your first one. Your second one will either be a port if it's on the coast or a farm if it's on the interior. And then you can do multiple things with those ports. We'll discuss that later. And then the construction site, I would like to make into a resource if the region has one. Well, if we zoom in here on Ariminum, those of you that can see, there's a fish icon right next to the name Ariminum. That means Ariminum produces the fish resource. So you can see here, fishing boats, the fish resource, right? I'll go back out to this tab. Fishing boats, the fish resource. So we're going to build that. But let's give you an idea of what it is. Fishing boats, extra hands, extra boats, extra yield. 10 fish, 120 wealth from farming, that's agriculture, and plus 0.1% second class citizens. So your second class citizens are your plebs. You get 120 more denarii per turn from farming agriculture, but you also get 10 fish to trade. So remember, in the beginning, I am creating a giant trading hegemony. So I want as many resources to trade as possible. This will give me 10 more fish to trade. Now, with each one of these buildings comes a nice description at the bottom. So we're going to read this description so we can learn a little bit about fishing boats and fish in Rome. Seafood has always been important around the Mediterranean. The sea could be guaranteed to feed everyone even when crops failed. Fish was also important to the Romans for garum, a fish sauce that they added to many meals to give them extra pep and flavor. Garum, however, may not sound all that appetizing to many modern diners. It was made from the salted intestines of fish, left to ferment for many months. The exact flavor of a particular garum depended on the fish used and the herbs added to the fermentation and bottling in amphorae. The varied and flavorsome garum trade was actually quite widespread and important in the Roman world. Troops expected garum to be available to season their food, even if they were on duty in far Britannia. As well as being tasty, if not essential, addition to the Roman meals, garum was also used as a medicine for all kinds of problems, although, given the chief ingredients, it was probably most used as a cure for constipation. Even so, garum was not universally liked. Seneca, the Roman Stoic philosopher, hated the filthy stuff even though his family came from a garum-making region of Hispania. So there you go. We learned a little bit about the fish resource. In this case, we learned about apparently what's called garum, which I had never heard of before, and how Romans liked it. I guess I understand that. I mean, we live in the modern world where we have access to all sorts of spices, but as a person who's not enamored by fish, I always have to have tartar sauce with my fish, so I understand why the Romans needed garum with their fish. As great as it was to eat and not have a empty belly, you also wanted it to kind of taste good. So, that is our riminum. We also have an empty slot in Ascalum, and if you look at Ascalum here, you zoom in next to the name, there is a little salt icon. Salt being hugely important in the Roman world, so we are going to build a salt mine. Salt mine. Hard work yields the necessities of life. 10 salt, 180 wealth from mining, that's industry, and plus 0.1% second class citizens. So we have some pleb population growth, we have 180 denarii per turn from mining, that's industry, but most importantly, we will have 10 more salt resource to trade with our neighbors. And about salt mines. Although it was greatly advanced by the Romans, many other cultures had long traditions of quarrying and mining. Over time, skilled freemen and artisan stonemasons appeared, who could extract and prepare the raw materials on site. Gold and gem mining in Egypt, for example, began with the extraction of material from the easily accessible alluvial deposits, while shaft mining in Nubia began as early as 1300 BCE. In the latter, Ancient methods such as fire setting were employed using water to rapidly cool the heated stone and shatter the rock face. Quarrying stone for great cities and monuments was well advanced by the 3rd century BCE. From the Parthenon to the pyramids, the capacity of the ancients to extract, work, sculpt, and transport stone is still evident today. So, that told us almost nothing about salt, but entirely about the mining process. So, 
That I kind of knew, but there's your mining process. I think later there's going to be some research that has to do with that, so one might learn a little bit more there. But that is most of our construction. There's no more empty sites that really need to be built upon. We could upgrade the villa in Beneventum in Magna Gratia, but we currently have the food or the taxes turned off there, so that wouldn't generate any additional food or income. I guess we can... You know what, we're going to hold on to our, our denarius for now. I always like to have a little bit of denarius in the bank just in case an event pops up or something, so we're going to keep that 3,426 in the treasury for now with only 1,765 gained next turn. So this is, this is what happens. However, we have the most important part of the oh, second God. turn. Legio II, led by our primus inter pares. Right? Our first among equals, Lucius Julius Libo, also the faction leader and the leader of my faction, the Julii. He is going to march north to Aretium. He has one, two, three, four, five units of Princapes with him, a unit of Triarii, a unit of Astati, and a unit of Equites. We're going to march him north across the border and into Etruscan territory where we see Aretium and the Shields of Menreba, led by P. Aurelius Traonis. We are going to attack. And there it is. Lucius Julius Libo of Rome, deploying 1,600 men against Publius Aurelius Traonis and the garrison of Servius Vibius Perennis. 900 men deployed with 2,125 reinforced. Now, I'm not going to fight this battle, so I'm just going to encircle the city for now. We were going to go over, you know, we'll go over it now. So, when attacking a city, this city has a army in it. That army is the first army led by Publius Aurelius Traianus. You'll see here that he has four units of infantry, and then he has him, the general. So, he's got the king and his horsemen. Some Etruscan Hoplites, some Samnites, some Etruscan Hastati, and some Etruscan Hastati mercenaries. Now these are regulars. These are highly trained, right? And they're like my legionaries. They're, they're going to be tough to beat. However, in the city, that reinforcing 2,125, it looks scary, right? Because put that together, that's 3,000 men against my 1,600. That's almost a 2 to 1 ratio. And this bar here shows that I'm going to get my butt kicked. But they're all levy units. They're regulars. Just look at this here. Three units of Italian slingers. So they're going to be throwing stones against my heavily armored Romans with shields. Okay. Maybe. Four units of Italian citizens. These are men in togas with kitchen knives going up against my legionaries. Oh, okay. Now you do have some town guard. Three units of them. They have a shield, a spear, no armor. They might be good for dealing with bandits, maybe, you know, troublesome citizens, but they're not meant to fight full-fledged Roman legionaries. And then the only thing that matters is the Italian swordsmen, and even then, they're still like a quasi-levy unit. They are not a regular. So despite the fact that it looks like the battle is not in my favor, we'll actually win pretty easily. And if you look at the auto-resolve here, every auto-resolve has me losing. No matter what stance I take, I lose win chance none. So that's one thing about DEI that you might not like. If you want to auto-resolve a lot of battles, DEI is not for you. The auto-resolve is basically broken. And even if you're fighting an army that you will win, you're going to lose a lot more men if you let it auto-resolve than if you do it yourself. So pretty much every battle has to be fought. The good news is this isn't like the first Rome Total War. So there's a reason why we only are allowed so many armies in the field. Basically, you know, the creators of Total War, uh, Creative Assembly, they couldn't figure out how to get the AI to stop making a bajillion armies that have like one unit or two units or three units. The AI just constantly spams these tiny armies. So as a human player, you usually have one, two, or three large armies moving about. You don't have all these small armies because it's a good way to get massacred. 
But the AI, who has, you know, giant treasury and money and everything bonuses, just spams them. So what Creative Assembly did was say, well, the AI can only make one army now, or four armies. They're the same constraints as you. They might be able to replace it quicker, but they can only have so many armies. So that's kind of what they did. It's nice, because you don't have to fight a bajillion small stacks if we ever do with the original Rome Total War, you'll see that, but it's also not nice in that you're stuck with only a few, and you can't auto-resolve now. So that's how CA kind of got by the bajillion small army stack. So you can assault, and that's if we wanted to fight the battle ourselves. we're going to do that next episode. You can break the siege if you want to take your army elsewhere, and then you can encircle it. The town will surrender in six turns we're obviously not going to wait six turns because as you can see above both these icons they have skulls these skulls mean i will be losing men to attrition and they will be losing men to attrition and if there's anything i can kind of tell you you do not want to lose men unnecessarily there are some times when you will have to siege a city but that's only when you're going to be building you know, siege works. This city of Aretium does not have any walls, which is why we could just march right in and fight the battle right now if we wanted. However, battles take a while, so we're going to do that next episode. I think that is pretty much everything that I wanted to do in game. There are some armies I want to move around, so I'm going to move Legio 1 up here near, uh, you know what? I'm actually going to move it on the border of Cosentia and Terrace so that I can watch. Nope, I can't even gain line of sight there. So we're going to be stuck here. I'm going to just put it into a patrol stance. So this is the stance I was talking about earlier that I really like. It's a new stance added to DEI. Stance. Patrol re region. Three units required. Police the province for vagrants and improve the infrastructure and economy of the local towns. So remember, legions, when they weren't actively fighting, they were doing public works. Three total units required to enter or exit a stance. You have minus 10 banditry in the local province, so they lose banditry. Minus 100% campaign map movement range, the army can't move. Minus 25 line of sight, can't see anywhere. Plus 4% replenishment rate for all units good to help you recover a little bit quicker. Minus 5% upkeep for all land units. You pay less, that's also nice. Minus 25% ammunition for all units. Does what it says. This is a big one. Minus 12.5% melee defense skill for all units. That hurts if you're attacked. The good news is you should never be attacked in patrol stance because forces in this stance cannot initiate battles. Forces in this stance cannot muster new units. And critically, forces in this stance are always ambushed when attacked. So you should never be patrolling a region if you're just hanging out near enemy territory. It's a good way to get that legion destroyed. It's something that you do in kind of your home province areas. You know, something you do when you want to, you're in a safe area and you want to give a bump. Now, you might be saying, well, there's not so much good coming from that yet. You lose some banditry and some upkeep, but that's it. Well... Relax there for a minute. You also lose minus 5% morale for all units. Once again, you don't want to be attacked, but you generate plus 4 public order per turn and plus 5% wealth from all sources in the local province. So you look at Beneventum, we're at minus 4 right now in Magna Gratia. We enter patrol stance, and we are at 0. We are not going to lose any public order next turn. On top of that, if we did turn the taxes back on, we would be from the high 400s to an income of 501. Once again, I'm not going to do it just yet. It sounds good, but not just yet. We're going to wait a little bit longer before we turn that tax back on. Now, we do have Legios 3 and 4 that are currently nowhere. We are actually going to put them in the cities. Once again, you might be saying, why are we going to put them in the cities? Well, that is a relatively easy answer. Legions that are in the city the commanders of those legions, the whatever you want to call them, I call them commanders, you can call them generals, uh, they will be gaining experience for every turn that they are garrisoned in the city. Now, if they have an army with them, I will show you at the end of next turn how an army influences the city. But, because they are currently empty legions, they're just generals sitting in the city, gaining experience. 
the way the game plays it, I think, is because they're in a city, maybe they're in a library reading, or they're being mentored, right? They have a place where they can learn, whereas if you're out campaigning, you don't really have a place to learn. So we're going to put them in the cities and leave them there. With that said, that is pretty much the end of this turn, so we can move on to our spotlight. Our spotlight Victory is Legion 2. So, did a little bit of a deep dive on Legion 2. It's very, very hard to find information on this Legion. A lot of it's like quasi or historical guessing, so take basically everything I say with a grain of salt. But we're going to go over what I discovered. So, Legio 2. Second Legion Augustus was its name. It was active from around 48 to 43 BCE to the 3rd or 4th century AD. It was a Roman Marian Legion. It was an infantry assault legion with some cavalry supporting it, and it had around 3,500 fighting men plus the support units. Now, I'm not going to go into what a standard Roman legion is just yet. We're going to review Roman legion and battle tactics in a different episode. This will just be about Legion 2. So it was created in the very late stages of the Republican era. Its emblems were either Capricornus, the constellation in seagoat form, the Pegasus, which is a winged horse, or the god Mars. Now the name Augustus might have come from either a victory or a reorganization. We're not quite sure, but we're going to give you some ideas here in a minute. So the history. Legio II was originally called Sabina. Now we're not sure why. There's a couple reasons. One, it might have been formed by Caesar in the year 48 BCE and fought at Munda against Pompeii in uh, 400 or 445 BCE. Once again, that would put the timeline at around after the Gallic Wars had completed, but when he was fighting against Rome in the Civil War. He was one aspect of Rome and Pompey was the other part. The other one, which is the one I am going to subscribe to, was that it was formed by Gaius Vibius Panza in 43 BCE and was recruited in Sabina. Now once again, it could be formed in 48 BCE by Caesar and fought in Munda against Pompey. There is some evidence to indicate that, but not much. There's also evidence that it was formed by Vibius Panza in 43 BCE and recruited in Sabina. We could also kind of marry the two ideas and say that maybe Caesar did raise the legion in 48 BCE, but maybe didn't give it a name right away because he was busy fighting a civil war, right? He crossed the Rubicon, the Dias cast, etc., etc. He had bigger things to worry about than the name of a legion. So when that legion was being reformed in perhaps 43 BCE, it was being reformed in the Sabina region, and that is why it was called Legio II of Sabina. Now, there is evidence that it fought in the Battle of Philippi in 42 BCE with Octavian and Mark Antony, and then after the Republicans were defeated, it swore allegiance to Octavian, now entering the Imperial Era, and then fought in the Battle of Actium in 41 BCE. After, you know, that was over, and Octavian won. Eventually, he had to go against Mark Antony, but when that was finally over, and Octavian put out all the fires, also known as Augustus, a lot of the army, he kind of dissolved. There were a lot of soldiers in the field, so it looked like Legio II actually got reorganized, and that's when it was called Legio II Augusta, so that would make sense that it was gone. Legio II Sabina fought Swore allegiance, dissolved for a bit, reorganized, and now it's Legio II Augusta. So, with the newly formed, or reformed, Legio II Augusta, we enter the Imperial Era. And it is sent to Hispania in 26 BCE. It is sent to Hispana Tarconesis to fight the Cantabrian Wars. That is in northern Spain. With Legio I Germanica, they helped build the colony Aki and built the city of Cartenia. So there was basically... A tribal group of proto-Spanish in that area that had to be put down, and that was the Cantabrian Wars. When the legions were not actively fighting, though, this is just a little bit of legion stuff, they often would construct public works. So, roads, cities, everything. Idle soldiers are troublemakers. If soldiers are just sitting in their camps all day, not doing anything, they start thinking, well, maybe I should be paid more, or maybe I should be doing something else. Or maybe this rotten garrison on the front line sucks and I should be stationed on the interior. So, 
commanders usually kept them busy working because uh, a tired legionary is much less likely to foment rebellion. Now, they didn't stay in Hispania for long. Eventually, there is the disaster of Turtleberg Forest, which we'll talk about later. Legio II Augusta was moved to Germania, you know, on the Rhine border, where Germanian Gaul is, and perhaps stationed around the city of Mogantiacum to help kind of, you know, buff up the border from the three legions that were lost in the forest. During 15 CE, it would participate in campaigns with Germanicus. After he was called, it was stationed in Argentoratum, and it helped put down a revolt in Gaul. A little bit of time goes by, and it was one of the four legions used in Claudius's brilliant invasion of Britannia. The commander was Vespasian, and it was active in southern Britain against many of the local British tribes. There's evidence that it was stationed at Alchester in 49 CE, and then moved to Wadden Hill. It was stationed at 55 CE in Executor. In 60 to 61, it took part in Boudicca's revolt, and it was part of the legion that Postumius commanded. He did not march to Suetonius' aid. There's a lot of drama there, but basically it didn't help. We can assume that it was massacred and that eventually the remnants were brought together and they did beat Boudicca back, but that was when Rome almost lost control of Britain. That is a revolt we'll touch on later, but for now we're just going over Legio II. In 66 CE, there's evidence it was in Glevum. It was in Britain like I said, during Boudicca's revolt, and then it was eventually reformed. A vexillation, or a detachment of Legio II, sided with Otho, and then with Vitellius in the civil wars, but there's evidence that the main legion was always loyal to Vespasian and did not participate in them. It constructed a fortress at Wales. In 139 CE, it built sections of the Antonine Wall. From 158 to 158, if 155 to 158, it fought in a revolt in Britain, where many, many men were lost. In 196, it supported Decimus Claudius Albinus when he declared for emperor. They were defeated by Severus in Gaul, but while the legion was in Gaul, because, you know, Albinus was revolting, the Picts overran Britain. So Severus picked up the defeated legion, Legio II, and brought it back to Britain where it was stationed at Carpau while he campaigned in Scotland. Eventually, he abandoned the campaign in Scotland, and the legion returned to Caerleon. It was there during the summer of 255 and the last mention comes from Rich Bear, Richboro around 260 CE. After that you don't see the Legion in the historical record anymore so it is safe to assume that during the crisis of the third century the Legion got lost. So in the crisis of the third century if it was in Britain at the time it would have fallen under the influence of the Gallic Empire. So the Roman Empire actually split into the Gallic Empire, the Palmyrian Empire, and the Roman Empire. So it just kind of got lost in that. And it's a miracle Rome didn't fall in the third century, but this was definitely the backslide of Rome, and it just it got lost. So, yeah, that's all there is to say about Legio II Augusta. That's it. I'm happy. It's only a 30-minute episode, but you know what? That's okay. Next time, we will take on the Etruscans at Arretium. Have a great day, and I'll see you next time.